Emma, and uh, President Yannick, and I'm really happy to see so many people here. I know there, um, there's been a tragedy actually on the um, on the train, and so there are some really bad delays. So hopefully we'll have the rest of our members showing up in a in a few minutes. But um, welcome, welcome everyone. Before we get started, some of you were here for the one full fan tour that John Stanley gave us. So thank you for the tour, John. It was a lot of fun. Thank you for coming. Really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. And does everyone have a copy of the agenda? If you don't, you can pick one up on the table out front. So if everyone could please consult the agenda and just see if there's anything that needs to be added. Anyone has any new business? Anything to add to the agenda? <laughs> All right, well, if there's nothing to add, I'm to motion to approve the agenda. Hey, Jeremy, second by AJ. All right, all in favor of the agenda is stand. Okay, all right, so that is tonight's, uh, tonight's agenda. So just a very brief report from me. I'd like to start out by thanking and acknowledging Matt Baker. Matt, can you please stand? For the wonderful, wonderful awards ceremony that was just fantastic. And if you, Matt, stand up again, sorry. Uh, anyone who is working on the committee with Matt, please stand as well so you can be acknowledged. And I know you guys did a fantastic, fantastic job. Thank you all, and now we'll be giving the report so we can also uh, sing his praises when he comes back up to when he comes up to Mike. So thank you, Matt. It was a lot of fun. Um, oh, Billy just arrived. So um, it was a really it was a it was a great evening. I think it will be posted soon. So if you missed it, we'll have it. It'll be on our YouTube channel, and you can watch it. And um, you know the presenters were great. It was also a lot of fun. Um, seeing everybody to present, including some live theater moments from the street, which are which are fun too. So yeah, so it was a great, great, great event. So thank you very much, Matt. Thank you everyone on the awards committee for doing such a fantastic job. Now, um, a quick announcement about what we are calling Committee Con, like you know, Comic Con or K Con, all this. Committee Con is a um, it's going to be a evening on March 23rd, okay, March 23rd from 6 to 7.30 in the evening to get to know the Gannick committees, all right? If you are a committee chair, you will have already received um, an email from Kevin Lawrence. If you're a committee member, hopefully you will be able to attend. And if you're not any, on any committees, this is a great time to attend, to get to know the committee chairs, to get to know what the different committees are doing. And, um, to have uh, to get an idea about where you can, um, you know, where you can make your voice heard, how you can join, and um, how you can contribute to GANIC. Um, one of the reasons we are such a fantastic organization is because of all our volunteers and people do a lot, a lot of work, and so much of it is done at the committee level. So this will be a sort of a speed dating to get to know the different GANIC committee members, uh, to get to know the different um, chairs and what they do and how you can possibly contribute. So I do hope you'll set that date aside. Again, it's March 23rd, and it'll be starting at six in the evening to 7.30 at the Lower Manhattan headquarters. So where we had the October meeting, I think it was, where we had our October meeting, really nice space down on Broadway. It's 150 Broadway, so super easy to get to. It's just like half a block from Fulton. So um, I hope you all will attend that. Um, speaking of Lower Manhattan, time to renew your license. <laughs> if you think of the of the offices downtown, uh, you should have received a form in the mail from uh, what used to be the DCA. I'm not sure what it's called anymore. Consumer Consumer Affairs Affairs and Protection. Worker Protection. Yes, so Department of Consumer Affairs and Worker Protection. Um, you should have your form. You can just fill it out online. It's very easy. I was sort of tripped up a bit when I went into to log in and said, put in your pin. I was like, what the heck? I don't remember my pin. I don't have a pin. It's right on the sheet. Okay, they give you your pin. It's right on that 
that sheet that has all your information. I was looking at it and I'm like, I'm like, oh, there's my hint. And so, I mean, it took me 20 minutes to figure that out. So that is right there. Okay. And so I filled it all out. You know, you just pay by credit card online. Super easy. There's also a phone number right there. If you're having any problems, you can call them up and get assistance. Okay. So please make sure you renew your license. I think they all expire at the end of this month. So um, you really want to get that done because you can't be a member unless your license is up to date. So um, that's really it from me in terms of announcements, but I also want to let you all know about Joe Spalak, okay? Joe was very ill. He had um, some severe heart problems and was in the hospital, I think for over a month, um, but he's home now. How long? 37 days, yes. So 37 days. Uh, actually, I, I, did, uh, did, I did text him and I talked to him while he was still in the hospital and he's like, now, I don't want to talk to anybody yet. I'm just not feeling up to it. But on Monday night, he sent a lovely email to the board and then to some other gang members, which I cut and pasted. I posted it on our Facebook group. If you haven't seen it, I have it just on my phone. I'd be happy to share it with you. But he's doing much better. He's at home. He misses everybody. He sends his greetings. And of course, we send them back to him. So what we have right now, we have a, a, a Get Well card that is circulating. But, um, please make sure you sign it. And we are also going to be passing the hat. Um, Patrick brought his best hat. Well, we passed it. One of best is my large hat. His largest hat. So fill this thing, people. Yes. So this will go. The Mensch Fund is our Gannick Fund. Um, the Gannick will match whatever amount is donated tonight. Okay. So whatever amount is donated tonight, we will match it. And then um, Kevin Lawrence actually is going to help arrange to either have food delivered directly to um, to Joe or some kind of meal service uh, because uh, he, he's not getting out a lot and um, he'd love to have company and people to visit him, but his task taking is very, very easy. So if you want to email me, I can give you Joe's direct email so you can communicate with him, but we are going to send him some food. Yes. The gentleman from God's Love We Deliver oh, yeah. who accepted his award last week made a point of saying if anyone you know is sick we would be happy to take care of the food yeah so this could be the ultimate good time perfect perfect thank you thank you for that reminder yes god's love we deliver who are super nice actually they've emailed me already and they're just lovely lovely people so um yeah that's a really good point thank you matt but yes everybody please be generous the hat's going around the card is going around um just make sure if you'd like to sign the card with a personal note Please do that this evening. And I will be dropping that card off actually with Kevin. And Kevin's going to be Kevin Lawrence, who, who uh, could not make it tonight. Um, he'll be helping to arrange everything as well. But thank you, Matt, for that reminder. God's love to deliver. It's a great idea. Okay. So, on that note, that's really all from me. Um, thank you all again for coming out here. It's great to see people in person. I really, really love that. Oh, and just want to mention to thank. Harvey and Bob for the wonderful yeah. holiday party. And to be acknowledged every I have such a great um, I think it's the first venue. I don't know. I mean I can go back and all of a sudden meet on the stage. That was great. So anyway, so thank you guys. That was a really a fun, fun night. And um, we always do a good job. The parties are great. So, John, would you like to hear to come up? So, John Sandlock is going to be introducing our guest speaker and our host for this evening. So, come on up, John. Sorry. Yeah, so, thanks everybody for coming. And again, thanks everybody who joined me for. A little walk through Greenwood, and I'm so excited to and honored to introduce our guest. The is the title chief historian or just historian? Historian. Historian of Greenwood Cemetery, uh, Jeff Richman, and the author of. I was going to bring it up <laughs> that he's going to be talking about in this presentation, uh, building the Brooklyn Bridge. And other books, uh, including a coffee table book about Greenwood Cemetery, and some uh, which I've put in the uh, several which I've 
mentioned on the agenda. Um, I first became acquainted with Jeff online, asking him questions about locations of graves, which are, can be a bit challenging in recent years. It's gotten a lot easier though with the Find a Grave app and you know these various tools and I just think a lot of research has been done. Um, but I've always enjoyed coming here and hunting for uh, difficult to find graves of famous and not so famous people sometimes. Um, but but uh, Jeff uh, has agreed, I, when I first contacted him, he, he, of course the idea was we would like to meet at Greenwood Cemetery and have a talk about Greenwood. Um, that seemed to make a lot of sense. A lot of people ask me, why, why aren't we talking about that? Uh, and he will be talking about it, but he told me he had this book about, about the Brooklyn Bridge. And of course we all give tours of the Brooklyn Bridge with tour guides. And so I think, well, we, this is like getting almost two for one, uh, something about Greenwood and something about uh, uh, my thinking there. But of course, as you all know, we normally in our meetings have a talk about, a talk uh, from the venue, uh, a representative about the venue. So Jeff will spend a few minutes talking about Greenwood and then he will get into a presentation about the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, and I see he's handed out the 3D glasses. So if anybody hasn't gotten them, make sure you have those. This is gonna be really exciting. Um, Jeff, uh, Greenwood Cemetery, I think is a, a fascinating place. And I, yeah, I think most people know that I've been in love with it for many years. And I'm reminded as, a, as I um, in, welcome you to the stage of a quote from a book that I think you may be familiar with about the history of American cemeteries, which calls the cemetery, it was from a sermon by Elias Leavenworth, and it calls the cemetery of the city, the last great necessity. Um, and uh, I think that's a word I'm gonna leave you with as you, if I, as I welcome you to come to the stage and first talk with us a little bit about this wonderful space here that of course is for many people, the last place that they reside in the great city of New York. Uh, thank you, John, and thank you to the uh, organization for inviting me to speak this evening. Uh, this seems like it's been at least three or four years in the works. So I'm glad we finally uh, are here this evening and uh, to see all of you. So thank you very much for coming in. Uh, as John said, I am the historian here at Greenwood Cemetery. Uh, I started doing tours here 31 years ago before there was a historic fund at Greenwood, and the historic fund was established in 1999. And in 2007, after 33 years of practicing law as a criminal defense attorney, both at the trial level and the appellate level, I decided I had had enough with crazy judges <laughs> and crazy prosecutors, and I needed to be a cemetery historian. <laughs> it's been a full-time job ever since. Uh, it was originally supposed to be semi-retirement and hasn't turned out to be that. And so uh, I have written, the, the cemetery has published four of my books, and then the most recent book on the Brooklyn Bridge uh, was published by a uh, book publisher. And so in terms of Greenwood, I wanted to give you some idea of the place. I'll do a, uh, as John said, I'm playing two roles this evening. So as the historian of the cemetery, uh, the cemetery is a huge place. It's 478 acres. It's close to a mile by a mile across. It's slightly smaller than Prospect Park. It's about two thirds the size of Central Park. And we have, I think we're pushing about 580,000 people interred here at this point. So I maintain, particularly with respect to the 19th century, there is no topic that you could give me that I couldn't come up with a dozen people to put on a tour. So in terms of touring here, well, let me first talk about the cemetery a little bit. 
There we go. And so here's a closer look at the cemetery. The cemetery is a National Historic Landmark. That designation applies only to the uh, cemetery itself and not to the people interred here. And so, of course, we have thousands and thousands of fascinating stories to tell. I think it's around seven cemeteries in America that are so honored. And so it's an unusual designation. Uh, this is David Bates Douglas who designed the cemetery. He was a civil engineer. There were there was no such thing as a landscape designer or landscape architect in 1838 when the cemetery was founded. And so Douglas was familiar with the sewers in Brooklyn and had some familiarity with the hills. Uh, and he did an absolutely brilliant job here. This is a precursor of Central Park. Greenwood becomes the argument for Central Park. And so A.J. Downing, the leading horticulturist of the time, says, let's build a central park. And will it be a success? Look at Greenwood Cemetery. Greenwood, by the 1850s, less than two decades into its existence, was attracting half a million people a year. And so when my first book was published in 1998 about the cemetery, I came up with this uh, fact that second to Niagara Falls was Greenwood Cemetery as a tourist attraction. It has uh, been repeated thousands of times, and so it must be true. <laughs> <laughs> and so we have a full schedule of tours here at the cemetery. Uh, we used to do tours up to 300 people at a time. We've since cut back on that, but I believe uh, by the latest count, there are over 300 events here that the Historic Fund runs. Uh, the cemetery offers four New York City landmarks, including the gates that you probably uh, came through unless you really got lost coming over here. And so these date from the Civil War, 1861 to 63, Richard Upjohn and Son. And we do light them at night on occasion. And we do have an extraordinary collection of materials, uh, approximately 700 stereo views from the 1870s and 1880s. The stereo view is what really brought me to Greenwood Cemetery. In 1987, I saw an ad for a professional photographer who would show you how to take even better photographs of the cemetery. And what I wanted to do was to see the scenes that I knew from the 1870s and say, oh, that stone has moved. And so uh, <laughs> that's what got me in here. And I was so taken by the place that I came back the next day. Back in those days, you needed a pass to take photographs in here, bizarrely enough, and that's no longer the case. And so I got a pass, and uh, I was off and running at that point. And so this is our uh, greenhouse across the street, which has become the virtual money pit. <laughs> uh, we acquired this in 2012. It is a New York City landmark. And uh, as you can imagine, each of those pieces of plexiglass that had replaced the original glass had to in turn be replaced by custom made glass. And then the glass had to be checked and tested and run through car washes and pressure washes. And so it has been a long and arduous uh, trip to get this done. But if everything goes according to plan, this will be a reception area, and then we will have an L-shaped building for education and a gallery space. So it is supposed to get started uh, again uh, the end of this summer. And uh, But I've seen uh, announcements on there that the project will be completed in 2016. And so I await <laughs> for celebrating. And this is uh, on the Fort Hamilton Parkway side of the cemetery. And so that would be all the way in the back of the cemetery to the south. This is by Richard Mitchell Upjohn, the son of Richard Upjohn. And these are also designated uh, New York City landmarks. We kind of cut a deal with the uh, Landmarks Commission. They had had the entire cemetery on that list. 
of potential landmarks for about 20 years. And then they decided to review the list. And then the cemetery actually opposed the idea of being completely landmark, fearing that every time we dug a grave, we would have to get permission to do that. So uh, the chapel uh, that's just over there and this were designated as part of that uh, uh, let's move on kind of approach. And so here is the chapel, which is a wonderful building by Warren and Wetmore, who of course, as you tour guides know, uh, did quite a few wonderful buildings in New York City and Manhattan, including Grand Central. And this gives you an idea of the tourism, I believe a Brown Brothers photograph of the cemetery circa 1800. And so uh, I checked and as I said, we have probably a dozen tour guides right now working. It used to just be me. And uh, we've added quite a bit. We have uh, two trolleys here that are used for tours. But you as tour guides are welcome to go on the website and fill out a, what I'm told is a brief application. And uh, the only deal is that we ask that you pay $5 per head to do a tour of the cemetery. And so the material out there is virtually unlimited. We were talking about scandals and we have scandals here, civil war, architects, painters, all sorts of things. And so if you're interested in doing that, just go to greenhyphenwood.com and uh, find the application and fill that out and just you know, do whatever you want. And nobody's interested in reviewing the material that you're talking about. You know, hopefully you get it right. <laughs> <laughs> Aside from that, uh, you're good to go. So, so welcome as fellow tour guides of the Greenwood Cemetery. Okay, so if anybody has any quick question on Greenwood itself, if not, I will quickly segue to trying to find my other slideshow. Yes. So is the landscaping, the hills, is was that natural or was that put in? Uh, it is natural. And so they were very proud of the fact. Well, first of all, Henry Pierpont uh, and Douglas get on horseback and they ride the heights of the Gowanus looking for the best place to put a rural cemetery. And they, in fact, wanted to be on the terminal moraine. Land was inexpensive on the terminal moraine because you couldn't farm it, you couldn't build on it because of all the rock rubble and because of the hills. But for a romantic landscape where they were interested in cutting off the vista so that you didn't know what was around the bend and you had this sense of exploration and discovery that maybe there's an angel around the corner or an obelisk or, or a bear or something else. Uh, and so that was why they latched onto this area, which also had a substantial population of water features. And so I think back then there were like eight, nine ponds left by the glacier. Now we have four that are still here. So it is a spectacular space where they took advantage of the natural hills and basically combed the rocks down, recycled them the same way, the way they recycled the uh, stones in Central Park for the fence. They recycled the rocks here into the beds of these uh, streets and the paths. Okay. Anybody else? Yes? So if we brought a tool here, they wanted to sit for 30 minutes, say a group of 20 people. Is that allowed to just sit on the lawn? Sit on the lawn. Or if, uh, if you are doing a tour and you are authorized to do a tour, I don't think there would be a problem with sitting down. Now, the cemetery can get a little finicky at times. It used to be even more finicky than it is now. And so I remember. 15 years ago, the uh, Adirondack hiking or mountain club wanted to come in here to hike. And so the superintendent at the time said, let me think about that and got back to them. 
and said, if you agree to walk and not hike, you have to be <laughs> <laughs> There's that. But I would, I would think that it would not be a problem. And if in fact, that's what you want to do, then you can speak to our programming people and they can alert our security that that's what you're going to do, that you're going to be sitting near Sylvan Water uh, for 20 minutes as part of your tour. Okay. Yes. I said your Halloween tour is legendary. Is there any truth to that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Well, I've been doing Halloween tours for, uh, wow, that was actually the first tour I did here. Is that right? It's in 1991. And I have a left handed tour and a right handed tour. So we do a Saturday tour and a Sunday tour. So, one of the wonderful things, some of you may be familiar with uh, Dr. Harvey Burdell and his murder. Mm -hmm. And so, on Saturday, we go visit Emma Cunningham, okay. who stood trial for killing him. And on Sunday, we go visit Dr. Burdell oh. as part of the tour. So, that's primarily. Well, first of all, we are banned from calling it a Halloween tour. It's a spirited stroll. We don't want to get too tacky here. So we, try to, we can't use the H word. But uh, legendary, I don't know. <laughs> yes. You have a side entrance there, Prospect Park West, I think it is. Right. But it's not open all the time, is it? It's open for pedestrians all the time. All the time? Yes, as a result, one of the, actually the things I'm most recently proud of is that when the pandemic hit, a number of cemeteries that shall remain nameless locked their gates and said, you know, call us in the morning kind of thing or get back to us in a couple of years. Uh, Greenwood, on the other hand, was very clear that we wanted to offer this green oasis as a space for people to get out and walk. And so up until then, the only gate that had been open during the week was the main gate. And as a result of the pandemic, each of the gates was open, one near Central Park, Fourth Avenue, the one Port Hamilton Parkway, the one Prospect Park West. And so those are still open for pedestrian traffic every day. And so the hours are slightly limited because we do there's an extra expense for security guards at each of the gates, but uh, it's been wonderful. We've had 300 ambassadors step up to help patrol, you know, to explain to people that nude bathing at a cemetery was inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> Who, who would have guessed? <laughs> so, uh, you know, but uh, a wonderful cadre of volunteers have stepped up largely as a result of their appreciation of the cemetery offering its grounds for that, you know, and climbing trees and jumping on gravestones. Yes. Um, I've always been intrigued that the spelling of the cemetery includes, like another institution we know very well, mm -hmm. the New York Historical Society, includes this perhaps archaic hyphen that you've decided to keep. And as I understand, that is the official and should always be used spell them in the cemetery greens hyphen wood. Can you, can you I mean is there any like was that ever debated? Was that you know was there, that just because it's that old that you know that they used up more hyphens back then? Like, you, they, it, that's actually exactly correct. Uh, everything seems to be like 10, 15 years ago. 10, 15 years ago, uh, someone wrote a kind of snarky letter to the Daily News saying what's with this hyphen in Greenwood and so of course as the historian I was deputized to spring into action <laughs> and so I started pulling books off my shelf at home of my own library tour guides to New York City in the 19th century and you almost immediately see that they kind of love nothing more than a hyphen and so Wall Street was hyphen and as you pointed out New York was hyphen, hyphenated. And so that's where Greenwood came from. The idea was at one point in the earliest years of the cemetery, well, actually the founding of the cemetery, what do you call this place? And so one for a suggestion was call it the necropolis 
And they said, no, 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 <laughs> not what we're looking for. And so the idea of green wood, when there were no public parks in either the city of Brooklyn or the city of New York, to invite people to explore nature, green hyphen wood works. And as we said, they did love their hyphens <laughs> in the 19th century. So that's where why we tried to keep that as part of it. It gets misspelled all the time. And, uh, but I think, if I remember the count, there's something like 19 other Greenwood cemeteries in America, which obviously jumped on it. And I think we're the only one with the hyphen. Yeah, it's yeah, still in it, so. Okay, good. All right, let me see if I can find this other slideshow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, is there like Roblin's Ferry here? No, unfortunately not. We do have a list, list of acquisitions we're hoping for. <laughs> well, you call it great. <laughs> all right. So first of all, with respect to the glasses, everybody have a new set of glasses? Okay, so with respect to the glasses, I would ask that you follow along with me. We don't need the glasses at this point, as excited as you may be. <laughs> and so I would I will cue you in as to when to put the glasses on and when to take the glasses off. Invariably, there's always someone like in the first or second row who keeps them on all the time trying to figure out why they're not seeing in 3D. And so all right. So building the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, I mentioned the uh, stereo views of uh, Greenwood Cemetery that kind of brought me here to begin with. And so around 1980, having always been a collector, whether it was baseball cards or marbles or whatever, uh, I started collecting stereo views of 19th century New York. And so just a few years ago, I donated my collection of almost 5,000 images to the Greenwood Historic Fund, including probably 80 or so images of the Brooklyn Bridge being built. Uh, and have always been fascinated by the Brooklyn Bridge, attended the Centennial in 1983, was on top of the Eagle Warehouse, watching the fireworks. And as a collector, I had bid on a lot of 25 stereo views, many of which I had never seen before on eBay about four years ago. And I was outbid, and of course, collectors, what says more about collectors than you go to a memorial service for a collector, and the widow of the collector introduces you to the guy who outbids you <laughs> on the 25 views of the Brooklyn Bridge being built. Mm -hmm. And so I went to his house, and he had just amazing images, and asked him if he might be okay with me using those images in a book. And then I knew another collector who has an amazing collection. And so those three collections plus three archives, municipal archives, which has the original drawings that they found in a dusty warehouse about 30 or 40 years ago, uh, which is a story unto itself. And the RPI, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, which has the Roebling collection, Washington Roebling's original uh, material. And then uh, the Museum of the City of New York, which has some wonderful material. And then Richard Hall, who is the biographer of John Roebling, the father who planned the bridge, 
he has an amazing collection of 19th century woodcuts that were issued as the bridge were being built, was being built. And so to put all that together, I could not resist the opportunity to create this book. And so here we are. Uh, this is easy for you. This is a bird's eye view of New York City with New Jersey on the left and Manhattan in the middle and then Brooklyn to the right, and you see the Brooklyn Bridge in place. And you see what's particularly important, that green area up at the top. Over in here. And that is undeveloped space in Brooklyn, which was a key because as the Brooklyn Bridge was being championed, where was Manhattan going to expand? Manhattan was considered full. They had no concept in the 1860s, let's build up, let's put these ugly little <laughs> pencil things that go 300 stories up. And so how do we expand? How do we get more labor in here? How do we get jobs for people? And so the idea was connect Manhattan with Brooklyn create a reliable transportation as opposed to the ferries, which were problematic. And let's go from there. So here, this gives you an idea. This is a token issued in 1889 for the 100th anniversary of George Washington's inauguration. The Brooklyn Bridge is only six years old at this point, And yet they put this on the back of that token as the eighth wonder of the world. And so this gives you an idea of how quickly the Brooklyn Bridge caught on. I think the number is by 1885, 30 million people were going across the Brooklyn Bridge in a year. And so all sorts of advertisers <coughs> wanted to be associated with the bridge. Uh, the masterwork, of course, is David McCullough's history of the bridge. McCullough was offered the opportunity to write an introduction to my book and mistakenly turned it down. <laughs> uh, John A. Roebling, the father, very interesting character, got to shortly, Washington Roebling, his son, and Emily Roebling, the wife of Washington and daughter-in-law of John. And so here's the book, and here is the table of contents. And so you see Richard Hall, biographer of John Roebling, wrote a uh, piece. And then Erica Wagner, uh, The Brooklyn Bridge, A Love Story. She is the biographer of Washington Roebling. And so both of them became involved in this book. And then I broke it down the way you see in the table of contents. And so we're kind of track that as we go. And so here are the chapters, engineers. So there again, you see John in Washington with uh, one of the early John Roebling plans, 1857 for a bridge up near what was then Blackwell's Island, now Roosevelt Island, pretty much where the 59th Street Bridge is, and the chief engineers, and John Roebling. So he's a very, very interesting character. He trains in Germany as an engineer, studies philosophy, supposedly was Hegel's favorite student. Uh, you see his burning eyes here. Uh, he was described as fierce, Apparently, never took a day off from work. His sense of humor is somewhat limited. <laughs> uh, decided that Germany was not for him, that the bureaucracy was such that he couldn't get anything done there. And so he put together a group of people, kind of on the QT, because they didn't want people with training to leave the country. And he decided he was going to be a farmer. So they came across. He winds up in Western Pennsylvania near Pittsburgh, and he found uh, a town called Saxonburg with his brother, 6,000 acres in Western Pennsylvania. And he had never farmed a day in his life. After about a year, he's bored. He doesn't like farming. So he leaves that to his wife and family. And he starts doing some surveying work on canals. And then he goes into the wire rope business. <clears throat> and 
builds the company up to the extent that when they get to Trenton and continue to get bigger and bigger, they become the biggest manufacturer of wire rope in the world. And so a great time late in the 19th century to be in the wire rope business with electricity and all sorts of heavy machinery and suspension bridges. He becomes the leading suspension bridge builder in the world. And so they're building suspension bridges in France, uh, in Germany, in England. Uh, many of them are collapsing. Uh, he never had a bridge collapse on him. He really, he's described as a genius and he very much was. So you can see the progression of his bridges as he built one after another. Uh, and here's the company that he founded. So they become Washington Roblin when he dies in 1926, the son, he leaves an estate of $29 million, which was real money in 1926. Here's the son Washington who becomes the chief engineer when his father is killed, ironically by the ferry. And so uh, we'll get to that shortly. Uh, he attends RPI, graduate in engineering. Uh, if you wanted to study engineering in 19th century America, you went to West Point to become a military engineer or RPI to become a civil engineer. Uh, he would spend his summers, you know, not going to uh, Florida or vacationing somewhere or touring Europe. He would help his father build a suspension bridge. And he was a Civil War veteran who had enlisted at his father's urging early in the war. His father said, I think you've kept your feet under my table long enough. Time to go. And enlisted as a private, rose to a lieutenant colonel and was kind of a zealot of the Civil War and that important events he seems to show up at. And he's in fact at the Little Round Top at Gettysburg with his brother-in-law, uh, Governor Warren, who has a bronze monument and Washington Roebling has nothing. <laughs> so we have to correct that. Uh, he's 32 years old when he takes over the construction of the Brooklyn Bridge. And then Emily Roebling, who is a fascinating figure in this story. Uh, she had no training as an engineer. She had gone to Europe with her husband to study caissons, which became key to the foundations of the towers of the bridge. And when he became what he described himself as an invalid, Washington Roebling, because of the bends and because of essentially a nervous breakdown from exhaustion, he had put so much energy into the bridge, she took over as the liaison. So Washington Romley, 14 years to build the bridge, 1869 to 1883. He never steps on the bridge while it's being built. He, uh, as we'll see, had a place on uh, in Brooklyn Heights where he could see the bridge. He had a telescope where he could watch the construction. For two years, he and Emily were in Trenton and he's running the construction of this massive project by letter from Trenton, advising his assistant engineers on what to do. So she's this liaison. She goes out two or three times a day to the bridge to tell the assistant engineers, here's what's next. Here's how you're going to do it. She's widely admired. She gets the honor of meeting the first delegation to walk across the bridge and then the first to ride across the bridge holding a rooster in triumph as she goes with the construction crew cheering her and waving their hats as she goes. So of course, there is now an Emily Roebling Park as part of uh, Brooklyn Bridge Park. And uh, I have a permit pending to speak there in May with anaglyphs of the uh, Brooklyn Bridge. So crossing the East River, uh, as early as the 1700s, they're crossing the East River. Uh, this is the ferry slip. Of course, Washington, his retreat from the Battle of Long Island goes across here, not using the ferry though. And then they were using horsepower. So horses on treadmills are what powered this before Fulton came along with the uh, steam engine. But of course, the problem with the ferries is limiting capacity. 
and also limited reliability. And so when the East River freezes in the winter, the ferries can't run. People start to try to walk to work across the ice. The ice starts to break up with the tides because the East River is in fact a tidal estuary and things do not go well. And so the solution is a suspension bridge. And here is the Scientific American, 1879, the great suspension bridges of the United States. And so you see four bridges pictured here. First one is a Roebling bridge, second one a Roebling bridge, third one a Roebling bridge, fourth one a Roebling bridge. So that gives you some idea. Uh, he had, for instance, uh, Charles Ellett built a bridge in Wheeling, got the contract over Roebling. Ellett's bridge collapsed uh, shortly after it was built. So here's the Niagara Bridge across Niagara Gorge, uh, a two-tiered bridge. On the top, you had a, a steam locomotive coming across with a train going five miles an hour. And underneath, you had carriages and uh, pedestrians. Uh, Mark Twain wrote about this bridge and said that uh, he wasn't quite sure what he was more afraid of, that the bridge would collapse uh, under him or that the steam engine would collapse on top of it. <laughs> so here we are, this is a stereoscopic slide view, uh, side by side images, slightly different. And so now you can pull out your 3D glasses, make sure that you have, I believe it's right on the left and cyan on the right and play with your eyes a little bit to get them uh, out of focus and in focus. And you should get a 3D effect there. <laughs> so that's the Niagara Bridge. And here's another view of the Niagara Bridge. So now you see the underneath uh, section. And in the distance at left, you see the uh, American Falls over there, and then the Canadian Falls over here. So these are anaglyphs that are, were created by a software program. A uh, Japanese software technician put this online free of charge. Unfortunately, he hasn't created anything for a Mac yet. So you have to do this on Windows, as painful as that may be. <laughs> All right, so here we're out of 3D for a moment. And so this is the Allegheny Bridge in Pittsburgh. And so this is Roebling trying out his technique with uh, iron, uh, iron towers. You see a series of towers there, not very high above the bridge. Cincinnati Covington, now known as the Roebling Bridge in honor of John Roebling, uh, built uh, started before the Civil War and then completed after the Civil War between Covington, Kentucky and Cincinnati, Ohio. And so this very much, you know, in your mind's eye, seeing the Brooklyn Bridge feels like that. Uh, there are substantial differences, only two cables here as opposed to four on the Brooklyn Bridge. It's kind of a mini Brooklyn Bridge, only one arch as opposed to two arches. And so here's a Courier and Ives print, and we see the essential elements of a suspension bridge. And so you see the cables here, four cables. You see the suspenders. So these are, uh, we have a competing uh, suspenders straight up and down. And so they hang from the cables, supported by the cables to the deck of the bridge. And then you have these extra wires, guy wires to reinforce the bridge to make it stronger. And you've got a truss system along the edge here to make that as strong as possible. So Roebling is very conscious of this idea of the strength of the bridge. So some of you may be familiar with the movies of Galloping Gertie mm -hmm. and Galloping Gertie, they did not have that consciousness. So here we are, a little bit more of the piece of that 1857 Blackwell's Island, um, Manhattan to Queens Bridge. And here we are, the ferries. So at the far left, you see the Brooklyn Tower. We're looking at Brooklyn, uh, the Brooklyn terminal of the Fulton Ferry with two ferries in their slips. 
And this is where John Roebling was mortally wounded. In uh, June of 1869, he goes out with Washington and with assistant engineer William Payne, and they're going to survey where the center line of the bridge is going to be. And he's on the slip. And so he's up against these wooden piles that allow the ferry to come in and get a little bit of uh, kind of cushioning as it comes in. And he thinks that he's stepped out of the way as this ferry is coming in. And in fact, he gets his foot first. And he believes strongly in treatment with water. Correct? <laughs> and uh, he's ordering the doctors around. He supervises the amputation of his toes without anesthetic. Uh, and he dies of a very painful death of lockjaw just a few weeks later. And now there is no chief engineer. And so Washington Rolling steps into that position. There was really no one else in America or probably in the world as well-trained as Washington Roman was, despite the fact that he was 32 years of age to take over. And so here is John Roebling's grave in Trenton. And here's Washington Roebling. Uh, Frank Leslie took a little bit of artistic license and made it uh, binoculars instead of a telescope. But this is his view as he monitored the construction of the bridge. And so some wonderful photographs, uh, I think this is Museum of the City of New York, identifying much of the staff and in detail. So it's particularly nice because it's keyed and tells us who each of these people are. And here's another view of the uh, staff and trustees and a detail. And so you have two of these six assistant engineers here. This is William Payne. Payne uh, had served in the Civil War with Washington Roebling. And the two of them were engineers. And their thing was to change out of uniform and, drop and ride on horseback across the Virginia countryside, mapping where rivers were, where hills were, where fortifications were. They were risking their lives because if they had been captured, they would have been captured as spies and subject to immediate execution. And so they knew each other from uh, the war, which I'm proud to say McCullough missed that. And Payne is in fact interred here at Greenland. And he was also a pioneer of cable cars in America. So he did San Francisco, Denver, Cleveland, and he did the cable cars on the Brooklyn Bridge. And this is George McNulty. McNulty was a graduate of the University of Virginia, 21 years of age, and applied to be an assistant engineer on the bridge. Washington Rowley said, I don't think so. And McNulty said, I'll volunteer. I'll work for free. And Washington Rowley then hired him. The six assistant engineers, one was hired on a 30-day contract. All six of them worked 14 years from the day the bridge construction started until the day the bridge opened. They're really quite extraordinary. McNulty, I think I have a gravestone. So here's Payne's gravestone right near Henry Ward Beecher at Greenland. And here's McNulty. This is part of our unmarked grave project. And so I've been supervising that since, well, for about seven years now. Uh, he was in an unmarked grave, and we had uh, salvaged gravestones from the Brooklyn Monument Company that was down the street when we bought their property. And so we've been marking gravestones uh, of people. McNulty uh, had a son who he named Washington McNulty after Washington Roman. So some of the just wonderful photographs of the crew, the workers, the workers were primarily immigrants, Irish, Italian, German, uh, veterans of the Civil War, uh, sailors who were used to being up high. And so here's a, a stereo photographer who understood what he was doing, that you need three levels of, to construct a successful photograph. 
And so you see the barrels and then you see the mid ground and the far ground. And so you can put your glasses on and take a look at those barrels there and they should pop pretty well for you. <laughs> Okay, so glasses off for a second. <laughs> we hold them and they're ready. And so here are some of the workers building the brick vaults of the approach. And here they are in 3D. Okay, so glasses off for you. Caissons, so the caissons were the foundations under the towers. This is what you were going to use to dig these big, massive wooden boxes. And so they basically use ship making techniques, uh, timber sticks, 12 inches by 12 inches that they bolted together with iron. These things were 168 feet long. And so McCullough calculated you could put four tennis courts on top of one of these and still have some room maybe for a bocce court or something. Uh, and the idea was you were going to position these where the towers were going to be, float them down the East River to that position, and then dig, send men into these boxes with compressed air to keep the water of the East River out and lower these things. These were the most massive things that mankind, humankind, had ever dug into the ground up until this time. And so here, of course, you wanted to get an idea of what you were going to encounter. And so they took samples. And here's a wonderful drawing, a detailed, wonderful drawing from municipal archives showing what they expected to see, smaller boulders and sand, and then a level of sand, and then sand with much clay. On the New York side, they discovered quickly that uh, it had been a garbage dump there. <laughs> and uh, some digging was easy but uh, many of the workers were overcome by the stench. <laughs> so launching the caisson, as I said, it was constructed by Webb and Bell, who were very prominent shipbuilders in Greenpoint. And then on the East 6th Street, uh, Eckford Webb is uh, buried here at Greenwood, right atop the catacombs of the cemetery. And so rather miraculous uh, monument when granite was really not being used very much for carving because it's so dense. So this is the front showing his shipbuilding career. And this is the back of that monument. Uh, an eminent shipbuilder and constructor of the caissons for the first uh, Brooklyn suspension bridge. So that was his proudest accomplishment of his career, even though he had built some of the largest ships on the seas. So here's the caissons and uh, Without getting into too much detail here, uh, they created uh, a series of shafts here that allowed them to use these scoops to go down and pick up the debris that was being brought into these water pools. And they used water in these shafts to prevent the compressed air from escaping. And so it was like kind of a giant barometer and they're pulling through and these things are getting stuck and the steel teeth are falling off and they're having all kinds of problems. But they also have, so this is the airlock to allow the workers to come in without letting the compressed air out. And then these are the supply shafts so that when they wanted to fill this, when the digging was done and they decided we're not going down any farther, they could get the concrete that was necessary and the bricks that were necessary to fill that. This thing is still under the tower of the Brooklyn Bridge, and it's going to stay there forever, hopefully. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right, so some of the just beautiful drawings of the bridge. And this progressed John Roebling's ideas of the planning, and then Washington had to take it to the next level. Uh, here we're seeing from Manhattan. So it's always a little bit of a uh, mystery which side are we on here. And so you see that Mansard roof on the Brooklyn side, but you also see that the Brooklyn Tower is the first tower that they started to build. And so it's up higher than the New York or Manhattan Tower. And so we look, know we're looking east from Manhattan. You see uh, 
these smokestacks here. You see uh, snow here. You see the stones that are going to be the tower. And you see some scribbling over here. And that scribbling says air compressor house winter. <laughs> and so Erica Wagner, the expert on all things Washington Roebling, tells me that Washington Roebling wrote that on this mount. So here's the airlock. Here we are breaking up boulders. They were doing this by hand. It was tremendously time consuming. And so Washington Roebling, ever the scientist, took a revolver down into the caisson and said, you know, what could go wrong? Oh, oh, Let's fire it with a small charge and see if anything bad happens. And so he did that and they looked around and the water wasn't flooding into the caisson and no one had died and no one's ears had been blown out. And so he made the charge a little bit bigger and kept doing that. And then they finally realized that nothing bad was gonna happen. And they started blasting these boulders and saved uh, probably a few years. Hmm. So here we are moving the debris. Here they are stirring the pool that that clamp is in, that uh, scoop is gonna pick up. And here we are vertical dredgers, just again, beautiful drawings by John Roebling. Here we see uh, one of my favorite things. I, I did have an expert on 19th century bridges consult on this. And so you see the two scoops here, these clamshells, one here, one here. And then you see this guy up here. And so what's he doing up there? He's looking down the shaft and seeing when the clamshell has reached the bottom and is in the pool. And he's waving to the guy operating the steam engine, telling him not to lower it any farther. So you've got like cutting edge technology with steel, the first steel bridge built, the first bridge to have electricity across it. And yet you've got uh, this kind of, shall we say, unsophisticated technology of this guy <laughs> waving, <laughs> stop the engine. So here's a, another view of the clamshell emptying out into a little uh, car, and then they would dump it into the river, and then supposedly they would dredge the material out of the river. So here we are, the two towers. Again, you can see the Mansard roof of the ferry terminal in Brooklyn, and you can see how the Brooklyn Tower has progressed up, up higher than the New York Tower. John Roebling's wonderful drawing. Uh, he was clearly influenced by having grown up in Mulhausen, Germany, which was surrounded as many such places were by a stone wall. And so he wanted this to be a grand entrance to New York City or to the city of Brooklyn, depending on which direction you were going in. And I think these are largely responsible for us seeing the Brooklyn Bridge differently from the way we think of the Williamsburg Bridge or the Manhattan Bridge. The, the solidity of this, so that I, I think it was uh, Lewis Mumford talked about the solidity of the granite as opposed to the tension of the steel cables. So here's a little bit extra that they put a detail in a woman with a parasol in this drawing. <laughs> And then here's Washington Roebling figuring out the towers. So the towers, in fact, as they stand on the Brooklyn Bridge are hollow. The, and so you see these areas in here, in here, in here, and in here, where they, there is no granite. So here is the uh, New York Tower going up because again, if you look closely, you can see the, the Brooklyn Tower up there. And I do love this photograph because this was clearly a photographer who had an in at uh, with the bridge to uh, get all these workers to stop working and also to get them to lift up these granite stones to make the photograph that looks more dramatic. So I believe this is Silas Holmes. 
as a photographer. I did become a chapter since I came at this from the standpoint of 19th century photography. An appendix discussing three of the leading photographers. Holmes is buried, of course, at Good Greenwood Cemetery with the hyphen. <laughs> and uh, he's an unmarked grave. And so I just remembered I am submitting a list tomorrow to the Long Island Sandblasting Company. And I have to put Holmes on that list and get him a gravestone. So here we are, views this as part of the Beale panorama of New York City, uh, showing you uh, St. Paul's, the book artist's shot tower, uh, the post office, 1876, and the Tribune Building. But it really gives you an idea of how this powered over the skyline such as it was in Manhattan. So we're looking, uh, this is South Street area right here. Okay, so here we are, we, we have a few beauty shots for you. So this is uh, glasses time once again. And we're looking, you can see the post office at the far left and the Tribune building there. And then a, another beautifully composed photograph. And then a third here looking from Brooklyn. Uh, again, a photographer who knew what like the heat was doing. Okay. And then a, a view in 2D of Brooklyn. So you know, Brooklyn, the city of churches, and you see all those churches, particularly on the uh, top there. And then the anchorages, so the idea of the anchorages were you had to kind of tie the cables down. And so one on each kind of beyond the towers with the anchor bars coming down and then the anchor plate at the bottom there. So this was a massive iron casting that they attach these bars to, and then the bars in turn attach to the cables. So this shows you the relationship between the anchorage, which of course is still there, but little seen, and the towers. So here are those uh, anchor plates, and here they are in 3D. We are very good with the last things. <laughs> All right, so there we go. And then here, anchor bars, and here we are in 3D. So what they're doing is they're taking these stones that you see stacked up there and surrounding these bars to really make sure they're not going anywhere. So Washington Robin made an interesting observation in Europe, when they did this, they left these accessible so that you could come in and maintain them over generations. Washington Roebling said, Americans are an impatient people. They will not want to maintain these. So I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to <laughs> build this anchorage right up to them so no one will ever have to come in here and maintain them. And so the footbridges and the cradles the footbridge is this construction of slats that allow the workers to go out on what they call cradles to monitor the spinning of the cables. So they're pulling wires across from Brooklyn for years, 13,000 miles of wire they pull across. So here you see the cradles. This is, I think, probably the best of the 3D images. Mm -hmm. So if you really want to thrill yourself, rock from side to side. Yeah. And you'll see those wooden supports in the foreground. <laughs> <laughs> Moving with you. <laughs> Does history get any better than this? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so don't fall off the tower. All right, so here we are. You know, I, I relate this to OSHA. What would OSHA say about this? This guy's standing on this board with a flag in his right hand. So he's going to wave to the guys who are pulling the wire. 
operating the engines that are pulling the wire if the wire is too tense or not tense you know, and make sure they're all lined up. So you look at his left hand, he's kind of got his hand up on the wires as they're being spun. Here we are with this wonderful um, sign. I think I have. Uh, it's a safe for only 25 men at one time. Do not walk close together, nor run, jump or trot, break step, WA rolling, engineering in chief. And so you see the anchor bars to the right. And you see no security guard, no fence, no nothing. <laughs> and so you can actually walk up on this thing and walk across the bridge. And here we are in 3D. And you see also the carrier wheel on the upper left corner. And that's what pulled the wire back and forth. And so now we're looking down, down the footbridge towards the uh, Brooklyn anchorage. And this is the shed right there that kept these spools of wire that they then pulled from Brooklyn over to Manhattan. Here's another one. You can really see the slats here. So the idea was they didn't want the wind to get underneath this any more than if they had to. And so let the wind go through there. And here we are again in 2D with a long, wonderful illustration of people who decided once they were up on the footbridge that they had made a mistake. <laughs> According to one of the senior men on the crew, women seem to react better to this situation. Than <laughs> All right, so here we are the cables. Again, the cables are what are the basis of the suspension. The towers allow the bridge to get high enough that you've still got a navigable waterway, but the cables are what you're hanging the bridge from. And so here's the master mechanic going across to show his crew that it's safe. Um, he thought he would do this quietly. The Brooklyn Eagle found out that he was doing it tomorrow. 20,000 people turned out and he was not happy. All right, so this is the basic idea of spinning like a clothesline catch the wire at some point and pull it back and forth. And here's a carrier wheel and just a wonderful drawing of the wire splicers. So the wires were only 800 feet long and if you're doing 13,000 miles, you gotta do a lot of splicing and so you might as well make a wire splicer. There's the shed on top. Here we are looking down towards that shed. Uh, and here's the wire spools, they were eight feet across. And here's the connection. So this is actually uh, in Manhattan. Mm. And I did figure out what that church was up in the right-hand corner. Escapes me at this point, but this is where they're connecting the anchor bars to the uh, wires. And Washington Rowling just, I think, beautiful graphics, trying to figure out how to lay out the 19 uh, strands that would make up each of the cables. I think Cincinnati is like five strands per two cables. And so here you've got 19 strands on each of four cables. And you can see his thought process here. Uh, you know, where strand number one goes here, two, three, where does 14 go? Where does 16 go? And he's changing his mind as he's thinking about. It. Here's my favorite photograph. This is from a collection of lantern slides that I bought from a used. Uh, TV repair shop in Tennessee on eBay years ago. <laughs> and this is basically City Hall Park would be over here. There's the post office at the foot of City Hall Park and the old Tribune building on Park Row. And here you see the four cables, one, two, three, four, two of which have been locked down, have been bracketed on two. And here you see the 19 strand of the other two. And this is the anchorage and the footbridge. And you even had a temporary railroad that they built out of wood to allow them to move materials around the construction site. And so what I'm, oh, here's another one about to be 3D. So this is the top of the tower. You've got the cable at the left. And I do have to change the caption in the book because I've uh, spoken several times with an engineer, professor of engineering, 
in New York. And he says, you see how this is twisted? That means that it was not a cable. The cables were straight wires because they're stronger that way. And so this is one of those angle wires that is reinforcing the uh, bridge. And so here we are in 3D on that. Washington Roebling spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to set up these saddles that were supposed to allow the bridge to move back and forth as the cables expanded and contracted with the temperature. And when they put the weight of the cables on these things, they collapsed. The uh, wheels uh, buried themselves in the saddles. So then they wrap, they used a zinc wire to wrap. And here are the sections of the bridge. And so they were basically, uh, well, ultimately five sections. Uh, beautiful drawings by uh, assistant engineer Hildenbrand of the approaches. Here's a good 3D of the approaches. Those uh, boards in the foreground should pop for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Post no bills. In the 19th century, you can even see the uh, tower, New York Tower at the far right. And here's that railway to move the stones. Here's one of the cars that they used. And you can actually see here how they're moving materials back and forth. So the suspended superstructure was essentially the road deck which they made out of steel uh, and hung from the suspender wires. So John Rowland was very proud of the fact they said uh, Broadway is 80 feet wide and the bridge is gonna be 80 feet wide. And then the feds stepped in and said, you gotta raise it up higher well after John Rowland had uh, died. And so they widened it also, so it's 85 feet wide. So here are the sections, carriages on the outside, the railway uh, inside of them, and then this one of kind pedestrian walkway in the middle, which is, was unprecedented and has never been repeated since. And so here we are in operation. This is an excellent example uh, why woodcuts are poor documents of history, because of course there were two lanes in each direction and this shows one. And uh, some of these are a real historic mess, but this gives you the overall idea. And here we are, the railways and the terminals. So they wanted a railway that you could take mass transit to Fulton Street in Brooklyn and then get across or vice versa. Five minutes on the trip, five cents to go across. This didn't open until September of 1883, about six months after the bridge had opened. I mentioned already Payne, and he was a pioneer of cable cars. And so here is the engine underneath the uh, Brooklyn side that drove the wire, the cable wire. Here's the Brooklyn terminal under construction. This lasted until the 1940s. Uh, you can tell Brooklyn because it has a bend to it, and the New York side was straight up. Here's one of the drawings. Uh, up on the top of the building, and there you see that very building. This um, assistant engineer McNulty did. And there's the bend in the building again. And here we go. Let's see. Oops. Movie seems to have disappeared. Someone's the space bar. Hmm. Um, this is, I, I know it's probably this. Well, in any event, you, you can see this is the uh, bridge in operation. Whoops. In 1899, this is a uh, movie that you can find online showing trolleys now working on the outside. So now you've reduced the carriage lanes to one. Uh, the trolleys, because you wanted more mass transit, and then you have the cable car also. And then, then of course, 
by the 1940s, the car, the automobile is ascendant. And so they make three car lanes in each direction. And then now that the bicycle is ascendant, September 14th of last year, they created a bike lane, which I am a huge fan of, not because I intend to bicycle across the Brooklyn Bridge, but because now the pedestrian walk is as it was intended to be by John and Washington Roebling, and you don't have to play chicken with the uh, bicycle riders as they go across. And so it's a wonderful thing. Opening day, May 24th, 1883, hundreds of thousands of people come into New York City and Brooklyn. President Chester A. Arthur is there. Uh, this fellow at the left is signaling to the North Atlantic fleet to fire and salute as Seth Lowe greets the president, welcome to Brooklyn, a union of hearts and a union of hands, and then the fireworks. And then of course the bridge remains strong in our hearts. And so if you're advertising the Knicks and the Nets, what would make more sense than to uh, show the Brooklyn Bridge? And here it is today. And here's the book. And here's, uh, I'm particularly proud of Kurt Anderson, a wonderful author. Uh, if you love Brooklyn or bridges or New York City or cities or 19th century marvels or all of the above as I do, building the Brooklyn Bridge is a perfect feast, a would-be traveler's delight overflowing with rare and evocative and fascinating images. It's a terrific book. And so you see Deborah Schwartz and Marty Markowitz and Tony Cruciaro. And this, finish with this, this is a quotation from Montgomery Schuyler who of course is buried here at Greenwood. It so had one of the first art critics in America writing for Harper's Weekly. It so happens that the work which is likely to be our most durable monument and to convey some knowledge of us to the most remote posterity is a work of bare utility, not a shrine, not a fortress, not a palace, but a bridge. Mm. And so that is So thank you. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to entertain those. Uh, yeah. The Roman factory at Zam Trenton, I guess, is still in existence, even though they don't make any wires anymore. Uh, yes, it was it was sold to a some sort of large conglomerate at one point. Uh, Washington Roebling. Invalid, as he described himself, outlived virtually everybody who worked on the bridge. And so he died in 1926, which by my math is 43 years after he completed the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, and outlived them all. Uh, his wife went to NYU Law School, as I did, and I graduated, as I did. And uh, lived until 1903 when she died. They're buried in Cold Spring, New York. No, no, no. They're, you can keep the glasses. <laughs> You'll be able to see the world in 3D. Good thing. Sorry. Where were these? blocks? The granite blocks were quarried. They were quarried in a number of places. So. Uh, there's a, uh, if you ever go up to Acadia National Park, that area, Mount Desert Island, there's a granite museum that I love there. Oh, and he's got all kinds of information uh, about. So some of it came from Maine, some of it came from New York, uh, on the Hudson, I think it was. So there were a number of quarries that they used. They stored it in Red Hook in a stone yard, and then they barged it up as they needed it. So we could see that photograph there of some of the barges with the stones. Each of the stones was kind of an individualized thing. And so there is a, an anaglyph, a 3D image in the book where you can see the chips that they've taken off so they get the exact fit that they wanted, uh, which reminds me, we saw about 15 anaglyphs, 3D anaglyphs. There are 44 anaglyphs in the book. Mm -hmm. So there are still many to see. There are 252 images in the book. Uh, the book retails at $55, uh, 
Uh, the cemetery is generously selling it at $45. <laughs> so if you're interested, I'm happy to sign them and inscribe them and whatever. So uh, buy our book and anybody else have a question? Yes. I'm, I'm not very good with symbolism. Why is the rooster considered a symbol of triumph? <laughs> well, that's an interesting question. <laughs> I, it may have to do perhaps with the idea of sunrise and that association and the idea of a new dawn, you know, beginning. Mm -hmm. um, I'm digging deep here. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best I can do. Well, I think it's the last question. Yeah, we have one question right here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right, right here. Oh, yeah. I'm just wondering how you collected all of the images. Um, that seems like a feat. Yes, uh, kind of one at a time. <laughs> so, over many years and many shows and many uh, organizations that you become a member of and you know, trade with people and that sort of thing. Actually, Mark had a question. Oh, the Golden Wild Arts in Oakland, New Jersey is actually now a museum, but it's with the pandemic only recently reopened Saturdays only. Yes, yes. So there is a town in New Jersey called Roebling, which they established. So Washington Roebling kind of you know, didn't feel well, kind of took it easy for a long time. He and his wife got up on the bridge at one point after it had opened and walked across it. Apparently nobody recognized them, knew who they were. Uh, in the 19-teens, when basically his brothers had died, his nephew had died, he took over the uh, rope works and ran the place with no salary, but it had substantial investments. And then like 1903, 1905, they set up a company town, Roebling. And so there is now a museum there. And in fact, I did a Zoom session for over a hundred people through that organ, the Roebling Museum. It's the south of Trent. Right, right, right. Interesting choice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're really out of time, but we'll just say one more thing. Uh, thanks for a great talk. Just wanted to uh, comment that another early advocate for what would be the Brooklyn Bridge is General Slocum, the real general, who is also very fair. On the other side, is here this morning. Not long ago, I was up at Emily, up in Cold Spring. Uh, her house is in town, pretty close to the train, but uh, if you want to walk a little bit, up a hill, a very nice grave for Emily as well. Cold spring. Right, right. Yeah. Thank you. Very yeah, good. just Thank very you. briefly, Washington Roble hated Slope. <laughs> <laughs> Leave it at that. Whatever that's worth. He hated Abram Ewart also, who is here at Greenwood. And uh Apollo goes on in some length about how much they hated each other. <laughs> Uh, you, um, if, the, if you want to sit outside, yeah, I'll be right outside okay. of the table. Right. If uh, anybody would like to sign you up, thank you so much. Outside. Thank you. Or that four minute each. All right. Um, due to our uh, to timing, yes, the reports, everyone has four minutes for their report. Our parliamentarian, Patrick, will be. Um, dropping the boom and you're going over time. So we're going to start with awards committee. So Matt, if you want to come up. All righty. The 8th Annual Gannick Apple Awards were webcast on YouTube. Uh, with nominees tuning in on Zoom so winners could make their live acceptance speeches on International Tourist Guide Day, Monday, February 21st, 2022. This would not have been possible without the contributions of an intrepid committee of volunteers, five of whom were Susan Birnbaum, Deborah Blau, Patrick Casey, Gary Dennis, and Jeremy Wilcox. But the two people who were truly the reason I did not jump off the Brooklyn Bridge 
during the headache inducing attempt to get this thing produced this year were my extraordinary deputy chair, Bob Gilbert, who was the voice of calm when I was freaking out, and my spectacularly brilliant technical director who made our ability to do this thing on Zoom possible, the extraordinary Sarah Lyons. For the first time, we had a major sponsorship with the industry partner Beyond Times Square, purchasing the $500 advertisement package that featured voiceover ads, while six other advertisers bought the standard five second slide uh, at 25 for one, 50 for two, culminating in an advertising sales total of $850. Our ticket sales uh, were $525 at $5 each, uh, indicating that the ceremony played on 105 devices, uh, not counting, of course, all of the participants who were comped. Uh, and so the total income for the show was $1,375. Our host, New York One's Shannon Ferry, donated her services rather than taking a fee. Uh, we purchased one month's worth of LiveStorm account only to find out that the app's video function had changed since last year and become significantly less user-friendly, uh, thus leading us back into the arms of Zoom. Uh, therefore, our most significant expenditure was the trophies themselves, which were slightly more expensive this year because of our first ever tie uh, in an award category uh, requiring one additional trophy. So the total expenditure uh, for the show was $3,589. Still not making money, but of course, a lot of our projects don't. We have cut our losses more significantly than ever before. Financially, this was the best award show we have had so far. All feedback received thus far has been uniformly positive with a charmingly gushing phone call from the folks at uh, the St. George Theater leading the pack. Uh, we also had our name and our trophy in a very prominent place on the blog for God's Love We Deliver. Uh, it is truly the kind of publicity you can't buy. On the flip side, this year we had the worst winner turnout since our second year, 2016. We had three no-show winners this year. Uh, it was made more concerning uh, by the fact that we had only expected one no-show winner this year. The other two were confirmed for attendance and did not show. Our treasurer's observation was that while our revenue was less than we had projected, so were our expenses. Our continuing quest to see the awards pay for themselves, the big decision for next year will naturally be whether to return to a live event or continue with the online ceremony. Naturally, live events are more expensive to produce, but we also charge significantly more than $5 per ticket. So a fair amount of that does come out in the wash. On the other hand, this year has demonstrated the potential power of advertising packages. If we can find willing sponsors, if every ad to flash across the screen had been like the ones that Beyond Times Square purchased, uh, that would have meant significant money and we will be focusing on how to make that happen in the future. Uh, there are certainly precedents revealed in other award ceremonies that ads are a better and more reliable source of income than ticket sales. And I think it would be a mistake to, take, to not take that precedent seriously. The awards committee has yet to hold its own post-gala meeting, so there will be more insights on that yet to come. Uh, but I believe I just heard Patrick's bell, so I am going to shut up and get off the stage. Thank you. I just want to add a postscript to Matt saying to note that the video, if you missed it or want to watch it again, the video will be up on the Gang YouTube tomorrow. So. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. So our next report will be Education Committee, and we'll have Bob Gelber reading that report. Okay, so we're going to start with First of all, the Ed Committee wants to congratulate. Harvey Davidson, our new guiding spirit. John Semlet for making all the arrangements to get us here tonight and doing a fantastic fan tour. So um, the Ed Committee, on behalf of all of our members and our chairman Namende, we will be celebrating Women's History Month with some dynamic programming. 
the program should take place as a virtual event March 22nd at 6.30, celebrating Women's History Month. And it's being organized by committee member Lisa Puccio. And we will have among our presenters, Susan Birnbaum, doing a segment on women foodies of New York. Rosalind Spiegner is doing Lena Horn. Trish Sullivan talking about Patty Smith. Lisa Puccio is doing Eliza Hamilton. Sarah Lyons is doing Elizabeth Ann Seaton. Stephanie Simon, Jane Jacobs, and Sam Christie, Kate Walker, the Lighthouse Keeper. On March 25th, I believe, is it 4.30, Robin, or Four it should be? Four o'clock, okay, wanted to get that right. Robin Gar will be leading our annual Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire Memorial Tour, uh, a tradition started by Lee Gelber. And April 22nd, we have a fan day trip to Philadelphia. We will journey to Philly, a city of brotherly love, and we will meet Philadelphia guide Nick Chetkovic. Chet Chet Thank you. That was a mouthful. <laughs> Uh, we also want to congratulate numerous uh, authors among our membership, and we're currently working on a writing guides panel. Right now, we know that Peggy Taylor and Apple Award nominee Sheila Evans will be talking about their new books as well. And the next Ed Committee Zoom meeting will be Wednesday, March 16th, 6 o'clock. We invite anyone who has anything to add wants to join the committee, please Zoom with us. Thank you. Well, so our next report is Government Relations with Patrick Kate. Very well. All right, hello everybody. Obviously, if you're seeing me up here, it's because 289A didn't get passed. We were committed to, we were actually promised to vote, by Donis Rodriguez and um, Diana Yella, and it didn't happen. We don't know why. We're gonna let the rumors go wherever they wanna go. We can't prove or disprove anything. But the bill is not dead. We did receive an email from uh, Councilwoman Yella that Adrian Adams, the council speaker, has given or turned the bill over to Justin Brannon, who is the council member representing District 43. As you don't know, that's Bath Beach, Bensonhurst, Bay Ridge, Diker Heights. Uh, there are approximately seven Gaddock members in that community. We have reached out to them by email. We're going to be waiting for a response. That email only went out today. What Brandon has to be pressured into is getting this bill put on the floor again so that it can be renumbered. It comes back into existence. It can be debated. And then you're going to see more coming out from the Government Relations Committee about targeting council members uh, to get their support in getting this bill uh, debated and get a vote on it. And we don't want to wait two more years where we're slammed up against a new election cycle. Um, but again, nothing can happen until Justin Brandon gets it out there. So initially, it is going to be the, we hope some of the members who live in the community that can work with us, that can meet with us, that can meet with Brandon. In face is so much more important than emails. And that's where we're going to find out who's actually taking meetings in person again. So more will be revealed on that front. Stay tuned. We hear from us by email. You're going to hear from us on our social media. Uh, near some time, I'm going to cut that short now and go right to our next activity. Dust Destination Capitol Hill is back up and running. Those not familiar with it, that is a trade and travel lobbying effort that will take place in Washington, DC, the first week in December, that uh, first week in March. Gannick has always sent a delegation. We're sending one again this year. That'll be myself as the chair of government relations. Kit Garrett and Harvey Davidson will be going as representative of industry relations. Guess what? We've got room for one more person. If you're interested in showing up in Washington and schmoozing, you're not going to meet the senators. You're not going to meet the representatives. They're usually not there. You meet with someone infinitely more important, the legislative directors and the chiefs of staff of those senators and representatives. You'll be given packets, you'll be given talking points. Be expected to schmooze, 
schmooze at least a half a dozen people on at that activity day. There'll be a seminar the day before telling you what the talking points are, getting you all the information that you're going to need to speak with our elected representatives. The big sell right now, Congress has to start passing legislation that funds Brand USA, and that has to give tax incentives to corporate and individual, you and I folks, travel to get the travel industry back up and running, because you know what? Too many communities rely on real estate taxes that ain't gonna happen for the next two to three years. Cities all across the country are seeing their downtown business areas not coming back, and with that, all of the businesses around them. Tourism has never been more important to this nation's economy. We've got to fight for it locally with our efforts on 289A, and we're going to fight for it nationally in Washington at Destination Capitol Hill. If you're interested, email me at governmentrelations at gannick.org. Governmentrelations at gannick.org. Thank you. So, yes, industry relations with Harvey. The Industry Relations Committee members, Bob Gilbert, myself, Assistant Party a party Committee Chair, Tony DeSante, with arrangements for the year-end party at Fogo Chow, which was a very successful event. Yes, it was. announced registration for its annual conference, August 26th to 30th, in Washington, D.C. The Industry Relations Committee will select a representative to attend. Bob Gilbert and myself met with a representative of the summit, and are working on arrangements for a site inspection for organic members. More to come on that. The Industry Relations Committee informed the board to select a member for a contest, Women in Tourism, for an award sponsored by Dabla Media, published by City Guide. I represented Gannick on the board of directors in an ex official capacity, and I attended NYC and Company's board of directors meeting and met separately with Fred Dixon, the president and CEO, and Charles Flatman, chairman of the board, to discuss safety concerns of tourists brought about by Coleman Foley O'Reilly. A new committee will be formed regarding this concern, and Gannick will have a representative. Foley expressed an interest in being Gannick's member of the committee. On behalf of the board, and especially the Industry Relations Committee and myself, we want to thank Mike Morgenthal for his outstanding, tireless role with his time and efforts as chair of the Industry Relations Committee. Bob Gelber and Beth Goff are the new co-chairs, and Kit Garrett will be the official board liaison to the committee. The board is encouraging me to continue my role representing Gannick as its associate director with the tourism industry organizations such as NYC and Company, New York State Tourism Industry Association, CIDA, International Inbound Travel Association, and other organizations. Thank you again. I'm truly humbled for honoring me with the Guiding Spirit Award. <laughs> Thank you, Harvey. And yes, as, um, as you might have just heard, Mike Morgan has sat down as chair of industry relations, and we all thank him really profoundly for his uh, amazing work over the past you know, many years um, on industry relations. I know Mike's not here, but I think he's going to Thank you, Mike. And up next, John Clintworth. All right, at the most recent board meeting, uh, we interviewed five new candidates. Um, four of them have paid their membership dues. I believe two of them are here right now. So I wanna welcome all of them. We've got uh, Michael Dunlop, who is in the back. Uh, we've got Juliana Daniel, who is in front here. Uh, and uh, here you go. Uh, Miriam Peters and Sam Silverman, who have also uh, joined us as members. We're very excited about that. Uh, 283 renewals up to this point in time. The projected number uh, for the budget was 265. So we're not even including the four new people who have just joined. Uh, those new members are not included in that number of 283. So um, GANIC continues to grow uh, despite uh, some of the troubles that we've been having in the tourism industry. Um, but uh, we are happy that Gannick is doing well. Uh, quick note, uh, if you had a great time at the party like I did, 
uh, then you should join the party subcommittee <laughs> uh, through membership. If you didn't want to go to the party because you thought it wasn't your kind of thing, you should join the party <laughs> subcommittee uh, through membership and uh, create some events that are your kind of thing. So we look forward um, to having folks joining the party subcommittee uh, through membership. I uh, wanted to say one other thing, and that is we are having a committee convention. Um, Kevin was going to be talking about that, but he was not able to make it tonight. So I'm just going to talk about that briefly. I don't know if you mentioned I just tonight. mentioned it passes, but good morning. So committee time. convention is the 23rd of March. We're going to be looking to have our committee chairs explain what their committees do. Uh, to have lots of people come in and learn about what the committees do, get excited, inspired uh, to join those committees and help Gannett grow and do lots of great things in the future, come up with lots of great ideas because they know who to talk to uh, when they have those great ideas. Um, we are hoping that many new members are going to be showing up to the committee convention uh, as an incentive, new members and veteran members who can convince new members to come, we're going to figure out how we're going to do this, are going to get raffle tickets. And um, thanks to uh, former member Joel Bernstein, uh, who donated his wonderful uh, New York City library to the first person who could come and pick it up in Long Island, who happened to be me, uh, we are going to be donating some of his uh, fantastic library books uh, to those raffle winners. So we're going to be supplementing your library if you are a new member who shows up or a veteran member who brings new members with them, you're going to have a raffle ticket and you'll, you're will you going to have a chance to win some great prizes. <laughs> so come to the committee convention, March 23rd. That's at 6 p.m.? Yeah, 6, 6 to 7.30. And that's in the lower Manhattan. That's where we had our November. Yeah. October. 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 Yeah. 150 bucks. And an, an official yeah. email announcement will be going out in the next week. Oh, Kevin said it's going to be tonight. Oh, might, might be. Really <laughs> soon, watch your email inbox. Tonight <laughs> is within the next week. That's yeah. right. <laughs> I just wanted to gin up some more excitement. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is something that Kevin Lawrence and Kit actually have been working on this too, but especially Kevin Lawrence, uh, as you mentioned at the, at the start, it's like a speed dating for organic committees. Um, you know, sometimes people think that, you know, Yannick is kind of clicky and that everybody just knows each other and you have to be in with whoever, I don't know. We're not like that at all. We just want to get stuff done. And it tends to be always be the same people getting that stuff done until we need more people to get stuff done. So we really would appreciate it. And every committee, if you're interested, I mean, IT, we're going to redo the website more people. Membership has a party. Yes. Mark and I are already starting to pull our hair out a little bit. But, um, you know, we want people to be on these committees. We want people to help out. Um, you know, even newsletter. I'm sure David could help, you know, have more editors, more people working on that. I mean, every committee needs more people. And um, that's how you get involved. That's how you get to know other members. And the members get to know you and they say, oh, well, there's a job that I can't take. But that person who was at my committee meeting was super nice. I'm going to give that person that job. Power. So anyway, so please, please come. Anything else? Does anyone have? Yes, Raman. I just want to make an announcement about a program that is a Zoom program uh, sponsored by the Brooklyn Public Library. So you can go to brooklynlibrary.org. Um, it's called Lenape Hoking, the Tenacious Myth of the Purchase of Manhattan. And it's a panel discussion uh, with Joe, ba Joe Baker of the Lenape Hoking uh, Center along with some other Native American specialists. I know it's come up in conversation quite a bit um, about land acknowledgements and things like that. So again, free program, March 24th, 6.30. It's a virtual program. So Brooklyn Library, Brooklyn Public Library. Great, so yeah, Brooklyn Public Library free program, um, Lenape Hoking. Um, Lenape and you know the people who were here way, way, way before any of us showed up. <laughs> okay, so anything else? Any other announcement, Jeremy? Uh, I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. Second. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh, God. All right. Thank you guys. Have a great Yes. <laughs>
Yeah. 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 Yeah.